One of the things I love about working with the amino acids is that I've learned so much from the people we've given them to who tell us exactly what a glutamine replete brain, you know, what a normal, optimal brain should feel like. And it's the same when we give the other amino acids that feed the other parts of the brain that are targets of alcohol and other addictive substances. When these depleted nutrients, we're really talking about amino acid deficiency, specific amino acid deficiency. When we get restored you know, to our natural supply of amino acids, we become who we really are. Our neurotransmitters, the brain functions normally and we find out who we really are. A lot of people haven't known since birth because they've been on junk food since birth and never had a really vigorous protein-based diet. Thanks for tuning in to the Elevation Recovery Podcast, your hub for addiction recovery strategies, hosted by Chris Scott and Matt Finch. Welcome everyone to the Elevation Recovery Podcast. I'm Chris Scott. Today I have a really amazing guest who's had a profound influence on me personally. Her name's Julia Ross. We have a video version, so you can check out this video on my Fit Recovery channel on YouTube. And Julia is the author of several books, uh, The Diet Cure, The Mood Cure, most recently, The Craving Cure. The Mood Cure actually helped me understand how amino acid therapy could help me in my early recovery. A lot of people call Julia the founder of amino acid therapy. So with that said, we're going to have a natural flowing conversation. I'm really excited. Thanks for being on the show, Julia. You're welcome. And uh, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about how you came from become, you were a trained psychotherapist, right? And then you got into amino acid therapy. So do we think we got a little recap on how that came to be? <laughs> uh that was an initially tragic story that turned into the best thing that could ever have happened. Um, I had been working uh, from the time I was in graduate school uh, for, oh, probably three years, um, two or three years when the crack cocaine epidemic hit uh, the recovery program that I was working in. Um, beautiful place. Um, uh, four-story Victorian on a hill in San Francisco, a uh, nonprofit, so there was no profit motive. We could do, we had the freedom to do whatever we wanted. We, we created the most comprehensive counseling and education program you can imagine. Nothing like it exists now, actually. Uh, we had that much freedom. And uh, we were so uh, in love with the program and our clients in this, it's a, you know, this residential program, and then the outpatient program that I founded after that, um, we're in love with it too. Uh, and word got out where well, the reason we started an outpatient program was because the people who couldn't live there were demanding you know, that we give them what we had. And then the crack cocaine epidemic hit and we started to get uh, the relapse statistics. And we found out that even with the alcoholics that had comprised you know, the majority of our clientele before that, um, we were getting 50% you know, relative, relatively long-term recovery. Um, and that was very depressing because we felt as though we were getting a hundred percent or more, you know, uh, when people were right in front of us and they were able to hold on to their sobriety, they turned into who they really were. Uh, and uh, we took all the credit. <laughs> um, but when, when crack hit us, so this is nationwide, Nobody in the addiction fields could handle it. And it was the typical uh, news nationwide that we were getting 100% re relapse rates within 24 hours. So we knew right then and there, you know, within, you know, six months of it hitting us that we didn't have the tools. And um, we blamed it on the drug. You know, this is a whole new drug. You know, we were doing fine with alcoholism, but we're not doing so, so well now. We're not doing anything now. It must be the, the whatever the drug is doing to these people. Um, and of course there was, there, you know, at that time there was also the, the lurking thought that, well, maybe it's just that they're losers to begin with, you know, especially um, 
unmotivated people that are drawn to cocaine in the first place. You know, this ridiculous rationalization that recovery people give to why what they're doing isn't working. Um, so uh, basically, we the whole field went into a depression. Uh, the, the, we didn't know what to do. We could not help people. And um, then we started getting conferences of neuroscientists. This is in you know, the early middle eighties who were uh, specialists in the addicted brain. And a lot of us went to those conferences and we tried to understand what the hell they were talking about. Uh, clinical psychology master's degree did not prepare me for understanding uh, neurochemistry. Uh, but then uh, one particular neuroscientist came through who'd actually done clinical studies showing success with crack eggs. And uh, he was using amino acids to get that success. And of course, I didn't know what amino acids were, but you know, it didn't take me long to figure it out. But we already had nutritionists on staff. That's how far we had come. We were already counseling people to eat better because we knew, and there was you know, some writing and some statistics showing how much better people did in recovery if they ate regular meals and ate healthful food throughout the day. Um, the trouble was that nobody followed our dietary recommendations <laughs> because all they could think about was sugar, which is a drug. And it does some of the same things to the brain that whatever their former drug, alcohol, crack, whatever was doing. Uh, but we didn't understand that. But at least I had nutritionists on board and one of them was a PhD. And I said to her, look at this study. It shows that in a cocaine only treatment program, this scientist proposed a study that the treatment program went with, which was that they would start giving everybody a multi amino acid. It actually only had three, maybe four amino acids in it, fairly low potency. Um, and uh, well, actually, no, this one had two amino acids in it, uh, both stimulating. Um, and after three months, they looked at the statistics and they saw that instead of getting 40% AWOL rates, in other words, people leaving after they paid $10,000, a week later, they'd walk out, you know, completely unfinished with treatment. Uh, instead of getting 40% AWOL rates, they were getting 4% AWOL rates. Wow. So you can see why that got my attention. And I got uh, uh, more information about it. I brought it to my nutritionist. I said, please research this for one week. And if it looks like a safe uh, prospect, let's start doing it right now. And I know right away who I'm gonna ask to be our first client, a crack addict who had been a bodybuilder and loved using nutrient supplements and you know, you know what knew what a good diet was. And so that's what we went ahead and did. She found there were no dangers to it, especially with someone who was obviously depleted in the amino acid that, that the brain can use to give us energy and, and the kind of things that crack forces on us. Uh, and that was how I got into uh, the amino acid therapy world. Um, yeah, I'm on. very glad you did. Yeah, because it changed <laughs> my life. And I was already in a period, I was probably six months to a year off of alcohol before I found your work. And I was struggling with anxiety, depression, and insomnia. And those are three big symptoms of post-acute withdrawal for alcohol. I hadn't been abusing hard drugs. Um, I'd never done cocaine. But I was a heavy, heavy drinker for years, starting in college. And then it kind of 
ebbed and flowed, you know, there'd be periods of extreme drinking and then periods of abstinence, which was just white knuckling, you know, when am I going to get my next drink? Just willpower. Uh, but my willpower reserves were my biochemical reserves of willpower were limited. So eventually I would drink again, but I found that, you know, I used tryptophan and five HTP to help deal with the depression helped a lot. I didn't even need much, maybe a few weeks of those, but then, you know, L tyrosine and DL phenylalanine, those helped me for the, the next year. I seem to have been really depleted in the, in the dopamine and endorphin sector of my brain. And I don't know, I would be a different person if I didn't discover those things. And it's odd to tell people who are recovering that these little capsules that may look to them indistinguishable from prescription drugs, except that they're, you get them in a store or Amazon, uh, that they can do so much for you. Uh, but for me, it was really life altering. So I know, I'm sure you've had a large impact on people coming off of alcohol as well. And that's like the big legal yet still really toxic drug in our society. A lot of people don't know that alcohol itself is more toxic than hardcore opioids as far as its overall effect on the body and the inflammatory response, you know, and you have these inflammatory, pro-inflammatory cytokines going to the brain, potentially inhibiting the synthesis of, or plugging in of, of neurotransmitters. Um, so I can see you're excited. I'll let you talk. Um, but I just wanted to, again, thank you for, you know, reaching people like me. I'm sure there are hundreds of thousands of others out there, you know, who are, who are feeling similarly. Well, I wanted, first of all, I wanted to ask you one thing, which, which was, did you have cravings at the time that you discovered the, uh, the amino acids? I was in the process of, of using um, neuro-linguistic programming to help reframe alcohol as a negative. There was a limited amount of, pro of progress that I made with that to, at the very least, rechannel my cravings towards other things. But I did still feel like I need. Yeah, there was a visceral desire for something. Yeah. And I, I, I knew that I could transfer it to other things. I've always been a type A intense person. You know, to this day, I don't like going a few days without working out. I need that dopamine and endorphin rush. And when I was in inpatient rehab, I was told, you know, don't work out too much. You're going to become an exercise addict. And I'm like, oh, maybe I'm sure that's a thing but I'm really not afraid of that compared to alcohol. But what I didn't realize was that it was the combination of NLP, you know, whatever I could do psychologically and lifestyle with the amino acids that brought me to a whole new level. So yeah, I would say at six months to a year, I had some alcohol cravings, but I had made some progress in extinguishing them using lifestyle and psychological strategies. Well, but when you say lifestyle, were you, were you eating well? I was trying my eating to this day, I'm seven years off alcohol now, and I'm still experimenting with things. You know, I've been largely keto, almost carnivore for the last month as a kind of experiment. I can tell you at, at that phase, I couldn't have gone keto without getting the keto flu. You know, I, I was still, you could say I was carb addicted. Okay. Um, yeah. That would be, that would be the typical thing. Um, at the time I was talking about when, you know, I was, moving from an all alcoholism treatment program into uh, some alcoholics, a lot of uh, cocaine addicts. Um, it was typical for people to be gaining 30 pounds in the, the first 30 days of recovery because of picking up the carbs, which do have a drug-like effect on the brain, which is why everybody's addicted to carbs now, uh, unfortunately, and hopefully we'll get to that. But, um, because it's so critical for alcoholics in particular to have a good diet. Um, we have found that it's useless to advise them to do so. Uh, <laughs> they just are too depleted to be drawn towards healthful food. They've got to go towards the, the substances that have some drug effect will give them some kind of a neurotransmitter boost and so, uh, whereas in the beginning, you know, we were bludgeoning everybody about a better diet. Nobody followed, you know, uh, the lead. They said it made sense. They wanted to do it. They knew they were hypoglycemic and that they were skipping meals and feeling crummy and, you know, relapsing, uh, 
on days when they hadn't had three meals. As a matter of fact, when we monitored relapse, skipping a meal was the most common trigger. They, they psychologized it. You know, it was maybe because, you know, I'm not living at home yet and a couple of counseling isn't going so well. But the truth was what made that day unique was that they had skipped breakfast. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so, of course, we went right to the food. That, that didn't help. So what we found when we added the amino acids was that uh, when we did it carefully, and I'm going to tell you what amino acid you haven't mentioned that is key to staying away from a toxic diet in recovery. Um, that, uh, l- let me start with the story. This is the, a scientist who, who discovered one of the amino acids, this very amino acid that uh, not only reduces cravings for alcohol, but also for carbohydrates uh, dramatically. And uh, his name was Roger Williams. And he in- discovered that there was this little protein fragment called glutamine. So glutamine uh, was, you know, huge news in the neuroscience world. You know, they found one of the last amino acids found in protein foods that existed on the planet. Um, and so he was flooded with, with, uh, with grant money and he started, uh, you know, a big a new lab. And one day he was walking through the lab and he noticed that one of his lab techs was doing an experiment. Uh, they had um, living cells uh, in a Petri dish and they had added alcohol and the cells were dying. Well, he'd seen that before. What he hadn't seen until that moment was when the lab tech added some glutamine to the mixture and the cells uh, came back to life. Mm. Now, they weren't entirely dead, but dramatic improvement. Well, that got his attention and that was, the, that was um, a turning point in his life from then on. He was researching how glutamine could help alcoholics. And uh, he didn't know that then, but uh, his discovery has helped us uh, with, with the carbohydrate addiction, which is now you know, a much, much more deadly uh, addiction than cocaine ever was or could be. Um, so we would have added to your protocol uh, some glutamine, which would have uh, helped you with the residual cravings, um, kept you from snacking on junk food, but you would have had to adopt three meals a day, which is a big step for a lot of alcoholics because they're used to having coffee all morning. Um, Can I pause you for one second? Sure. I actually, I didn't mention this, but glutamine was fortunately among one of the first amino acids I discovered because I, against the advice of the rehab program I went to, while I was still an inpatient, we were allowed to go to a gym. Um, they, ah. I wasn't against it, but next to a gym was a GNC. And they said, don't get vitamins and supplements. You're going to get addicted to those. Just like you get addicted to everything because you're an addict. So I went in, I said, this is stupid. I'm sore. I've been sore, you know, since I got here and I feel like crap. I got some glutamine. I had no idea about the research that you were talking about. I mean, I do now. And I've since used glutamine extensively. I still use it to promote recovery. I knew what it was then because I knew bodybuilders took it to promote muscle recovery. It does all sorts of great stuff. And I, I did take that. And ultimately, I was able to keep away from the toxic, horrible, processed carb foods that people were eating. We had a cafeteria there. It oh, was good. not uncommon for people to have a plate of French fries, a plate of mac and cheese, and an ice cream sundae. And that was literally the only meal that they would have. Or maybe they'd, they'd have the same thing again a few hours later. They'd be tired and cranky, and then they'd say it was their disease wanting them to do something. But it was really the blood sugar swing they were on and the inflammation and God knows what else. But no, I did take glutamine. I, I was happy about that. But I didn't know that glutamine had done that for me. I thought of it as just a muscle recovery thing while I was trying to rebuild myself, which it was. But I didn't know at the time until months later what you were talking, what you're talking about now. Well, one of the, the important things about what you're saying um, is that um, 
muscle builders know that uh, they're, they need more glutamine in order to build muscle. So without the glutamine, they might consider themselves in a, an amino acid deficiency condition in terms of the goal of building muscle, which is you know up to a point is a healthy goal. Um, and when you give someone glutamine, uh, they can build more muscle. Um, we look at, at it uh, in the light of the subsequent research, which shows just extraordinary health, specific health benefits for glutamine. And um, one of them is um, glucose and insulin regulation. So uh, it, a lot of alcoholics, like a lot of the rest of the population are diabetic uh, or pre-diabetic. And um, so it's important for them to know that glutamine can protect them from the progression of that disease. And of course, uh, the specific subjective experience of that is that they're not interested in that kind of, in sugar anymore. Uh, they're, they're really happy to turn to high protein, good fat, lots of vegetables. Um, I'm not a carnivore fan. Uh, <laughs> I'm a maybe for, for long term, uh, yeah, long term nutrition. I did have some bison liver the other night and I got a, a nice little natural high from it. Um, so I, I like to incorporate organ meats and other things people think are gross, but I also like to have my microgreens and my broccoli rob and my fermented foods and all of that. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a shock to me when I realized that the glutamine I was taking was being converted into energy in my brain, I believe, without causing a corresponding insulin spike, which you would get from an ice cream sundae. And so that's why it is really one of the keys for regulating the, the sugar and insulin or, you know, the, the insulin response. A lot of people are walking around having to eat carbs all the time especially if they were hooked on alcohol because alcohol itself is a highly refined sugar, right? Right. And, and so it raises blood sugar that is dropped too low and gluten, but it raises it way too high. And, and then the next thing that happened is insulin's released and then it goes too low again. Whereas glutamine is so sensitively used, especially in the brain, which um, doesn't have a, a backup supply of, of fuel of glucose, but the glucose enters the scene and it very sensitively raises glucose levels, not overreaches, but perfect. So that there's not too much and there's not too little. And when we ask people, what's the subjective experience of being on glutamine? They say, I feel balanced. I feel even, they don't even know about the blood sugar situation yet. And they're giving this language. And it's one of the things I love about working with uh, the amino acids is that uh, I've learned so much from the people we've given them to uh, who tell us exactly what a glutamine replete brain, you know, what a normal optimal brain should feel like. And it's the same when we give the other amino acids that feed the other parts of the brain that are targets uh, of alcohol and other addictive substances. Um, when these depleted nutrients, we're really talking about amino acid deficiency, specific amino acid deficiency. When we get restored you know, to our natural supply of amino acids, we become who we really are. Our neurotransmitters, the brain functions normally and we find out who we really are. A lot of people haven't known since birth because they've been on junk food since birth and never had a really vigorous uh, protein-based diet. Right. Yeah. I, um, I field some interesting questions when I do coaching for alcohol recovery. Uh, one that popped out to me recently was, you know, well, I always choose low sugar wines or, you know, I drink tequila, so there's no carbs in there. Um, what would your reaction be just out of curiosity to, to someone who thinks that they're, you know, they, they do keto. I've had clients who are aware of the, of the ketogenic diet or paleo diet, they seem 80% healthy until you learn how much they drink. So right. yeah, what would your- I learned, I learned this from a couple who came in. The woman was very clearly 
addicted to carbs. And he had said, well, why don't we go see this woman who seems to be good at getting rid of cravings for carbs? But he was curious about it. He came with Well, it turned out he was a huge alcoholic and had been for decades. And he really had no interest in stopping drinking. Um, he was a big blogger in the keto and the paleo world. Mm-hmm. Um, so both keto and paleo um, advocates uh, often do gravitate towards uh, alcohol. And as you say, you know, or caffeine, you know, low, low carb, what's the problem? Well, the problem is that, that the uh, substances are targeting not the glucose uh, receptors, but the receptors for the endorphins, our natural pleasure enhancing neurotransmitters, GABA, our natural tranquilizing neurotransmitter. Um, And so their craving just leads us directly to what they need. So when we ask them, well, what is it that it gives you that you like? It's not giving you any calories. So what, do, what is it giving you? Um, and then they tell us, you know, well, it relaxes me. So we, re- we know right then that what they're missing is their natural capacity to relax, which is provided by a single neurotransmitter called GABA. I mean, there are a few others that are relaxing, but that's the major inhibitory or relaxing uh, neurotransmitter. and we can, we use a sublingual uh, low dose uh, uh, GABA uh, lozenge uh, in our trialing. We do live trialing at our clinic. Um, and when I teach people about doing you know, acid therapy, I teach them to do the trialing uh, so that people can see in real life immediately that this stuff is going to work. And when they get an individual amino acid that's targeted towards what they need, uh, in this case, GABA, uh, we see people reporting in, I'm, I'm serious, two minutes. Oh, yeah. And they'll sit back in their chair, you know, uh, instead of being on the edge of their chair. And they'll smile. Uh, and uh, so, you know, this, this is really the story of amino acid therapy. It is fast, you know, and it is easy to identify. And the substance that you're using and the reason that you're using it is the key. So if somebody's drinking because they can't face um, the pain in their lives, you know, maybe they're in the middle of a divorce and they know that if they quit drinking, they might not have to have a divorce, but they can't quit drinking and they can't quit drinking because they can't tolerate pain. Um, They don't have adequate amounts of natural painkiller. And so you were one of those people who really responded to the amino acid that that shores up our endorphin levels. And that too happens. Uh, It might take five minutes, uh, but- uh, First time I took it, it was like a, you know, I I like to say I started to live life in full color. It it Ah. felt like that and the tyrosine, I mean, the DPA helping out with the endorphins, but also the LPA and the tyrosine. There was some of those at some point I started, I, I went from living in this kind of cold, bleak, black and white world, an unfriendly, potentially malevolent one to a more relaxed, bright, suddenly there's flowers on the ground. I swear there hadn't been any plants before. You know, you just notice things. It's a different mode of consciousness that you get from amino acids. Well, uh, it's, it's what you get from protein. Uh, these particular proteins were ones you were really deficient in. Um, so um, at this point, uh, you know, when, when people are discovering what they've been missing, that it's a simple nutrient deficiency. That's what's so extraordinary about alcoholism and all the addictions. They're really not, you know, National Institute on Drug Addiction has publicly uh, admitted complete failure in finding what they've been looking for for decades, which is a drug solution to the addiction world, you know, to all addictive diseases. Um, That's how hard people are looking 
for elaborate uh, solutions, elaborate causes. Um, it's so simple, you know, it's just simply a nutrient deficiency. And it could be, uh, you could be deficient in as many as five nutrients. That's the, the limit of the number of amino acids we ever typically need to use. Mm -hmm. So some people need the relaxing, but they also need the painkilling amino acids. They need to build up those two parts of the brain that those amino acids serve. Um, so fine, they take two. Other people definitely need the glutamine with it um, because of their cravings for carbs, uh, their hypoglycemia. Um, but you've mentioned another one, uh, which, which we haven't talked so much about, and that is they need energy. They need motivation. They need excitement. They need enthusiasm in that, and they need to be physically active. And that all comes from uh, a family of stimulating, uh, naturally stimulating neurotransmitters. Uh, we call them the cats for short, the, the formal term is the catecholamines. Uh, but um, lots of people are hearing about dopamine now, which also has a rewarding, um, it sort of draws you to something that's going to make you feel better. Um, it won't, you know, unless you have something rewarding uh, you arrive at that thing, uh, it doesn't help you much. Uh, so if you don't have much endorphin, you could take a lot of energizing tyrosine, the amino acid tyrosine, and want to find reward, but you won't. Um, but it will give you energy and um, mental focus. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting that, I mean, most people don't say, oh, alcohol, yeah, it's great for energy and mental focus. I did. For me, it was. It yeah. was. I would so, drink so I could do my laundry, take out, take the dishes out of the dishwasher and dance around while doing it. Okay. But otherwise, it wouldn't get done. We had one client who was a bookkeeper, and she would go down to the local wine bar and, and do her work. Uh, she had to have wine to do her work. But uh, it, it's probably the least... Um, common reason for somebody to to drink is to get energized i think most people would identify with the oh i get to relax you know so that's what alcohol does for, can do for gaba or okay i go home and my wife's bitching and i don't really care because my endorphins have been over uh activated by the alcohol uh i think i got I think I might identify with all of those things. Um, you know, I, I would use it to fall asleep. I would use it sometimes to wake up. Uh -huh. I had like a multi-layered series of deficiencies that all seemed to respond very well to alcohol in the short term. And of course, my whole system was deteriorating and rapidly by the end of my drinking career. But that's part of the, the difficulty with uh treating individual cases is biochemical individuality. And I know you make use of questionnaires, which are really, uh, really cool and, and detailed. And I know there's frustration with people using trial and error. I used the, just the trial and error method. You know, my assumption was um, I'm not, and this was before I found your work and, and the questionnaires and everything. And there are all sorts of different cool methods. I'm hoping we have some AI algorithm that just spits out exactly what someone needs within 10 years. But I thought, all right, all of these are safer than the alcohol I was drinking, all of these amino acids and evidence-based herbs, vitamins, minerals. So I may as well just take them and see what happens. And it actually, it did end up working for me. It took longer, but it, it, uh, it worked. And, you know, I know some people don't respond well to certain amino acids. It's not common to have a severe reaction, but, you know, someone on SSRIs probably wants to avoid the serotonin precursors or at least take it under the guidance of a professional. Um, so you don't get serotonin syndrome. Well, um, so by that, you mean tryptophan or 5-HTP supplements, that, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, well, but, there's, there's a whole chapter in the mood cure on how to uh, utilize these marvelous alternatives for antidepressants. Um, and just to give you an idea, uh, the simple version is you tell your psychiatrist or GP, whoever's prescribing, that you'd like to do a trial of just a few days on, the, on a few amino acids, just one amino acid, really, uh, four or five hours away from the drug. 
And they usually say the following, well, it probably won't help you at all, but it won't hurt you. You know, sure, go ahead and try that. You just don't want to take it on an ongoing basis or any closer to the time you take your SSRI. Fine. So then they do their own trial and they find out how much better it makes them than the SSRI is currently making them. And then they call their doctor again and they say, I really like this better, much better than the SSRI. I've been on it quite a while and it's actually helping me less over time, which is very common. And so you said, please help me with uh, uh, an attempt to withdraw, um, to taper down off the SSRI. And I'll follow your directions. Um, if you're okay with it, I'm gonna continue to take these supplements that fuel serotonin. And, uh, and then I'll go off and I'll keep taking them and as long as I need them. Um, and we have only had one psychiatrist who said no. Hmm. And, and no one who's been distressed. So the worst thing that could happen is either it doesn't help or you do have a reaction of taking the two in the same day, even though they're far apart. Very, very rare. Very, very rare. I've actually seen some research showing that people on SSRIs um, who did take 5-HTP or tryptophan, I can't remember which it was, but felt better. And so that not only were they not getting serotonin syndrome, but they were being helped. So that made oh, me yes. a little less paranoid about, you know, talking about these things. The last thing anyone wants is to get an email from someone saying they got serotonin syndrome, but I've not heard of that. I know it happens in extreme cases, but I don't know what the dosages involved are. But the coolest thing being, you know, with this is that with an SSRI, and obviously I'm not advising anyone to, to change anything based on what I say, but you're creating a dependence syndrome when you're on a prescription drug, you know, that's artificially concentrating, let's say serotonin between the synapses, right? But if you take 5-HTP or L-tryptophan, you're replenishing the natural supply and you might not even need to take them forever. It's not like a new drug that you're on for the rest of your life. Oh, no, as long as you eat, uh, start eating protein three times a day, so that you get your own food-based supply of tryptophan coming in. Uh, nobody stays on it uh, permanently. Um, the, the reason that most people do have difficulty with this is that there are so many people now who are on two SSRIs uh, and, uh, or an SSRI and an SNRI, which also almost all of them target serotonin as well as norepinephrine. Um, Many of the people who are on two SSRIs are on something like, um, well, of course, Prozac, but uh, Zoloft or, or Lexapro or whatever. Uh, but they're also for sleep on an SSRI that is only used for sleep. It isn't a very good antidepressant, but it's called Trazodone, which is wildly popular. Uh, but when you're doing this, um, transition from an SSRI to the aminos and you don't know that trazodone is an SSRI, you might very well take tryptophan at night because it's good for sleep, right? And the next thing you know is that you're not feeling well. <laughs> um, so that's one of the things that um, I caution people about uh, on the website and, um, and also, of course, in the book. Um, there is one mistake that I made. I wanted to take the opportunity of being on your interview uh, to admit to this. Um, we were talking about hypoglycemia and the importance of glutamine. The questionnaire for neurotransmitter deficiency in the mood cure is only four part. There's a fifth part that should be there and that is uh, a questionnaire about do you have hypoglycemia? And if so, you need to take glutamine. There's information about hypoglycemia and glutamine in the book, but it's not, you know, uh, positioned right in front, you know, in the first chapter with the rest of the questionnaire. Um, so I, I know you're very detail oriented. Um, and my co-host, Matt Finch, 
who you know I'm I'm close with and you've known for some time now. Um, he warned me. He said, "Make sure you're very precise when you talk with Julia because she's very she can she'll call you out if you make a mistake." So I'm trying to speak <laughs> with immense precision here. But I, I, it's good to know you're also self-critical with your. I, I don't think anyone will fault you for not including that, but I'm sure people will appreciate that. And you know, it's always good to know if you have hypoglycemia. Definitely. Yeah. So I, there are so many topics I, I want to cover. Um, I do I do want to talk about the uh, cra the craving cure um, and the issues with diet. I know we've touched on diet a little bit, but something that keeps coming up, whether we're talking about food or about addiction treatment, is the difficulty of innovating uh, and getting past whatever the powers that be are. And I don't want to get either of us in trouble <laughs> with them on on the interview. But, um, you know, do you think there's hope for changing the paradigms, either for food addiction, which is rampant now and arguably a bigger deal than alcohol or, or drug addiction? Um, or well, there are more deaths from food addiction than from alcohol and drug addiction combined. Sure. Yes. Including tobacco. Well, I was remarking to a friend of mine the other day, you know, we're both bachelors in our 30s. I said, it's rare for me to meet a healthy looking late 20s, early 30s lady who doesn't have like multiple health problems under the surface, things that come up and I'm not faulting them for this. It's just a, a systemic issue. It seems thyroid problems. Um, they're on SSRIs. They've been on them for years. They've been on benzos for years. You know, it's not uncommon for me to meet someone. Oh yeah. I take Xanax. I've had a prescription since college. Um, eating disorders, eating disorders, for sure. That was the next one on my list. And if not eating disorders, then severe carb addiction, that would be you know, hard to reconcile with the fact that they seem to be fit. And it seems like they're, they're ultimately in a losing battle. A lot of people are in a, in a losing battle in the long term between their arguable over exercise, uh, eclipsing the amount of carbs that they're eating all the time and, and bad, bad food choices that seem normal uh, because societally the bad food choices are normal, unfortunately. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating to, um, to me because I grew up uh, in the 1950s and 60s and everybody was normal weight then. Everybody was active. Everybody was normal weight. Uh, there was no um, no onus, you know, the, on different people's weights. You know, the different weights that people had. Everybody knew that it was just like different eye color. Oh yeah, everybody's a different weight. They come from different. You know, he's got a German background, and she. You know, you know, they're Italian. Uh, you know, so we just knew we were different from each other, and. Um, and there wasn't uh, the criticism, but when you look at crowd scenes in the 50s and 60s, and I have, um, when I do my PowerPoint presentations to my trainees and, and the public, I show them pictures because they don't know what normal crowds look like. They think normal crowds are full of obese people. No, I've got you know endless numbers of crowd scenes where there aren't any obese people. <laughs> from the 50s and 60s. And there, you know, if I had them, we'd have plenty of pictures from the 40s and the 30s and the 20s and all the way back. Um, but the 50s and the 60s are interesting because we had plenty of food then. You know, the restrictions from the war, the depression was behind us. We had plenty of food, but nobody was overeating. So in the 60s, we started uh, to get some weight gain. Um, you know, that was the, 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 that was the decade of tab. Uh, so it was the first uh, sugar-free soda, mm. um, but it was minor. It, most people were um, trying to lose weight so they could look like the model Twiggy, not because they thought they were too fat, but they just thought it would be fun. I mean, I remember it, you know, I was already really thin, actually too thin. So I didn't have to do it, but my friends who knew they were beautiful, said, yeah, but I want to see what I would look like if I, you know, was it her weight? What they didn't realize is they were going to set off this yo-yo of under eating, which would slow down their thyroid, which would mean that they would gain unneeded weight when they finally got off, you know, whatever restrictive diet they were on. 
um, and then they would go on another diet and then they would lower their metabolic rate even more. And then they would, you know, gain it all back and then go on another one. So, and that was even before the food industry got as sophisticated as it is now on addicting us. Uh, that is their complete focus. Uh, the food that we're getting is an unbelievable profit center because it's 60% nutrient void. So it's just these super cheap ingredients, um, hardly any you know, nutritional value at all, um, refined to the, to the point of uh, extreme uh, brain toxicity so that you know, we get, you know, we get high on them and we become addicted to them. We can't stop. Um, and uh, we're just doomed to uh, death by diabetes eventually. Um, I have a member of my online course who had a very sugar heavy childhood and he's healthy now. And he's also recovering, recovered from alcohol addiction, but he has a theory that the constant sugar growing up primed his brain to lead to alcohol addiction such that potentially, and it's, 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 it's a theory, but I'd be interested to hear what you think about it. Cause I think it's plausible when it, when he finally encountered the alcohol, his brain was, I guess, toxified, if that's a word. Also, he was used to this blood sugar swing and he found this highly refined version of sugar that created an even greater hit and it was just like graduating to the next level and so sugar was like a gateway drug which is not a term i like i make fun of it a lot of the time but in this context it makes sense maybe sugar is a gateway drug it does um and you know for some some people have um this is part of the big problem now is that uh, some some people have some genetic vulnerabilities you know, maybe there was alcoholism, you know, grandparents' generation or, you know, some kind of vulnerability. Um, but they would never have lived it out. In other words, it wouldn't have become a major influence on them if they were not eating such a nutrient strip diet. Because our genes have to be programmed by nutrients. Mm -hmm. If we're not eating them, nothing works properly, including our genetic programming. And so we are developing symptoms that we would never have experienced because um, the genetic program just isn't functioning normally. Right. Uh, now back to the, the theme of, of resistance from, from the, some of the powers that be, and we have big food, big pharma, government agencies and groups and lobbyists that seem to be allied with them. Um, and I know, you know, you, you had mentioned something when we talked on the phone prior prior to this. Would, would you mind repeating that? No, not at all. I mean, I when I wrote my first book, it never occurred to me that I would be the target of anything, you know, because I had no idea it was going to be such a big hit. And um, even if I had, um, it just didn't occur to me that anybody would be uh, threatened by what I was saying. Um, well, within a month of uh, my first book coming out in 2000, 20 years ago, I got a call from a representative of General Mills. And I tell this story in The Craving Cure, but I'd be glad to tell it here. So what happened was that I said, well, why are you calling me? <laughs> you know, I couldn't imagine why he was calling me, but I was, I was certainly alerted to the fact that he knew about me. And he said, well, we like to stay on the cutting edge, but um, there, was, there was sort of an ominous tone. <laughs> he wasn't <laughs> offering you free cereal for life. <laughs> no, but uh, the rest of it is fascinating too. He said, actually, I just have the one question for you. I know you're busy, you know, um, and uh, that question is, uh, is pretty, um, hot for us right now. But before I ask it, I want to tell you, I want to admit to some things because then we won't have to argue about them. We can just go right to my question. So um, let me admit that we use damaged um, and nutrient uh, empty starches. Um, they're damaged because we, you know, we, we have to make these really cute shapes, which requires 
all this overcooking and overprocessing and so forth. Um, the same with a, something similar goes for the fats uh, in that they are poor quality um, vegetable oils. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't have much other uh, nutritional value in our food. Um, and of course, we do market to children. Um, uh, and finally, we are increasing the amount of sugar in our products on a regular basis. Uh, so we said, getting that out of the way, let me just ask you the one question, which is, do you think that our stuff is physically addictive? Well, I was uh, flabbergasted that he would ask me uh, and also that he wouldn't know. Uh, I really didn't believe that. Um, but uh, I said, you know, I do have research in the book about the physical addictiveness of it, but I'd be glad to get you more if that would be helpful to you in changing your formulations. And uh, he said, as a matter of fact, I really want to encourage you to, to, you know, between the two of us, we get together a think tank to try and figure out, is there anything helpful that you could put in those boxes for breakfast for the, for the children? Because if you, if you could figure that out, you would be the hero of every ge following generation. Oh, wow. He up and said, you know, we're going to save these kids. He said, uh, well, maybe I'll get back to you on that later. Uh, I'm just feeling too depressed about what you just said about the physical <laughs> addictiveness right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's amazing. Um, you know, and I, I certainly haven't heard anything from, I'm not big enough at this point to hear from big rehab. Um, ah. so, you know, I, I, I'm actually encouraged by, I think there is something of a trend, especially among younger doctors, younger health practitioners, some even younger counselors who are trying to actually help people with their addictions in terms of their openness to this. But, you know, there just does seem to be a certain stubbornness, people who have been doing it for a long period of time um, well, there's, there's one reason that we did discuss this earlier today for the reluctance, the reluctance, I would say brick wall, uh, uh, uh surrounding treatment that's been there, um, uh, since, uh, I would say the eighties, um, the eighties was the first time where everybody in the field that I knew admitted to at least 90% relapse rates in their treatment programs. And so I always wondered, well, why aren't they willing to even trial the, the nutritional methods that I'm advocating? Uh, some of them spend good money on a, on a really good diet. They also have tons of candy and everything, but they really provide some good food. So it's not, I wouldn't think it'd be the money what is it? They, they, they've known me for years. They trust me. We've worked together and known each other as friends and they won't take a step forward. Um, and then uh, when I left after 14 years, this uh, nonprofit um, treatment program that I'd been in and, and had started outpatient programs in and, and had introduced the nutrients into um, one of the, the, uh, program directors in the local area took me to lunch. And uh, he said, I wanna help you with some strategies um, to make what you're doing successful. Cause I know you've never been in business before. You don't really know anything about it. So, um, and, and we run our program like a business. So let me give you some of the principles that we follow. And he gave me some good marketing advice. Um, and then he said, um, Here's another thing that I'm going to share with you, but I will never admit that I ever said this. And uh, he said, what, what we do and that I advocate you're doing is that you build in a, um, a weak, um, ineffectual aftercare program 
So that let's say you're an outpatient program. So you might see people for 12 weeks. Then after that, you know, like once every two weeks or once a month, you would have a free group where people could come, you know, for support after leaving. Um, and I, I said, why would I do that? You know, uh, and he said, because you're creating a guaranteed source of income. They will inevitably relapse, but they'll come back to you. They won't think it's your fault that they relapsed. You know, we make a we make it pretty clear that if they relapse, it's on them. Uh, so they'll come back to you. They love you. You know, you were really kind to them. Uh, and, uh, and that actually forms the core of your income going forward is relapsing. Right. Yeah. So in essence, uh, systemically as, as a whole, if you reduce relapse rates down to say 5% instead of 90%, you're obliterating the rehab industry, um, at least from the in terms of the amount of profits that they get now. Um, yeah, that's an atrocious business plan. But uh, and also, but doesn't it explain why they're not more interested in looking? It totally at explains. Thing? Yeah, because I mean, I having been in the business, you know, around it for so long, I know that they've spent plenty of money sending staff to learn new interviewing skills or new, uh, or, you know, hiring a yoga person or, you know, various things they're willing to do, uh, various things, but not this. <laughs> it's, it seems to me though, you know, and I, I, I don't come from a place of hating all businesses. I don't think you do either, but oh. I think that it's with 30 to a hundred million people potentially needing help. There's no shortage of people to help, you know, like, of course, it's easier to get repeat customers, but that's demoralizing, you know, and it's, um, uh, yeah, that leaves a sour taste in the mouth. It's for sure. murder. Yeah. And if, if he had actually understood what it is that you do, I think he would understand that the people aren't inevitably going to relapse. As you said, amino acid therapy is potentially a very effective and rapid treatment for a lot of people. And, um, you know, and that's just not the nature of. Of, of what you do, but it does make sense now that, that you put it that way, um, that that's why it's not seeped into the whole system. It's going to take, I think, a paradigm shift. It's going to take enough co uh, collective consciousness about what we're talking about for these places to no longer get away with what they're trying to get away with, either consciously or subconsciously. And you know, the inpatient place I went to, I'd say people were kind, they wanted to help, but most of them had gave no thought to their own business model. There's just a, a few people who are giving thought to that. And, you know, maybe they were just tagging along with what everyone else did. Um, so yeah. there might, it's not necessarily the case that there are evil people in rehab centers who want high recidivism rates, but it is the case where there's a culture in which that's rewarded. People do tend to respond to incentives. Well, and, and this was a corporate treatment program that this man worked in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's very different from the independent uh, treatment centers that used to be the majority that it's not true anymore. The corporate treatment um, industry is moving in and buying up uh, the formerly independent programs, you know, at quite a rate. So, um, but yeah. you said something earlier when we were talking that gave me a lot of hope, and that is that uh, it's not actually um, unheard of in Europe for treatment to be integrating some nutritional strategies in with the other perfectly good, they're good strategies. They just don't work for stopping cravings. That's right. Yeah. And so um, one of my friends and uh, business associates named uh, Dr. Rebecca Erickson, she, she's working on her second PhD now. Um, she has a PhD in nutritional genomics uh, from Imperial College, London. She works at the Executive Health Clinic in Marbella, Spain. And she said it's common practice there. And that's a very glitzy. I, I, I traveled over there to meet with her and, and um, a, a business partner for my supplement company. And 
it's there are a lot of wealthy people there. Um, so it's probably called executive health clinic for a reason. Maybe they can afford these specialized holistic treatments. But she, I don't know if she had read your work or Joan Matthews Larson's or whatever, but she, it seemed like she was, she was just very in tune with everything I had read. And she was looking at all these studies. You know, at one point I lamented, I said, you know, I wish there were more studies on nutrients for alcohol recovery. And she looked at me like I was stupid. She said, there are thousands of studies coming out of Europe all the time. Um, and she was like, what's wrong with you guys in the U S why don't you give, she's like, you don't give people amino acids when they come in for alcohol addiction. I said, no, <laughs> almost never. Um, and so I, I don't know that it's common practice everywhere in Spain, but, um, she seemed to think that it was way more widespread and, and that, that was news to me. I know there is a certain open-mindedness in Europe and say like alternative therapies, maybe not nutrient repair, but the Sinclair method in Finland, I believe is, is like a lot more utilized as a, as a therapy here. There's a lot of resistance to the Sinclair method because it goes against the abstinence only uh, AA approach. Um, and so I'm, I'm neither, I'm not saying that everyone needs to do that or not, but it's interesting that in Europe, there's just a more open-mindedness. I think there's less of a puritanical abstinence only influence and, and less of a, all you need is, you know, black and white. All you need is your higher power and working the steps. That seems to be less the case over there. Well, uh, do you think that you could uh, ask her for some of that research? Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Let's get it. We can, you know, you can get it automatically translated on the internet. Uh, and, for sure. uh, we really need it because yes. there is a, you know, a blockade on this kind of research um, over here. Yeah, we I will absolutely ask. Yeah. And I'll let you know. I'm Great. sure. Um, yeah. I'm always impressed with people who are multilingual. She can read studies in English, you know, and the rest, I, I only speak one language. So, but she, I think she speaks uh, Spanish and she's, um, she's half Danish. She probably speaks French or German. But yeah, there are some impressive, impressive people over there. So I'll get you that that research. Um, I think we might be approaching an hour here, but I, I wanted to I, I wanted to make sure we didn't leave anything out. Um, <laughs> well, we did. Believe me. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. We left lots of things out. Um, but, you know, if there's someone out there listening for the first time, they're really inspired by your work um, or they're excited to, to get your books. Um, you know, is there anything that you would tell someone who's struggling and you know, maybe you just need some informational support. Oh, yeah. Um, please go to my website, juliarosscures.com. And uh, it's composed of three segments, uh, one for each of the books. But uh, go right to the Craving Cure um, section of the website because it has a really good uh, questionnaire that's complete, uh, all five parts. Um, and because whoever calls is probably um, not only craving alcohol or drugs, but drug-like foods, you know, it, it's a very appropriate questionnaire. And it's divided into the five sections for the five neurotransmitter deficiency symptoms that could be driving your particular uh, cravings. And that way you'll see how specific it is each section is very different from the other. And maybe you're a, maybe your whole, all your, all five of your pleasure centers are depleted. That's good to know. Maybe there are only two. Um, so that will give you a very concrete understanding of your own brain chemistry and where you need nutritional help. Um, all of the books, uh, the diet cure, the mood cure. The mood cure has a specific chapter on addiction. So in some ways, you know, once you've done the questionnaire, um, you could get the the, uh, the mood cure and, and dig into the specific substance that you're struggling with. Um, but the principle is the same, whatever the substance you're struggling with, whether it's sugar um, or, uh, you know, alcohol, um, these five brain centers, you know, and their nutritional status is the key um, to explaining it, your cravings and to eliminating your cravings. And it's not hard. And at one point I think we should make very clear is these nutrients are cheap. 
they're very cheap. And if you use them sublingually, you only need half as many because they hit you a lot harder. Everything hits you um, if it absorbs through your mouth. So if you um, trial your or take your amino acids um, diluted in some water uh, and switch it around in your mouth, it'll get right to your brain and you'll get more benefit more quickly. Um, but even if you don't have time to do that, which most people don't, um, plus some of them don't taste good, uh, some of them do though, uh, you, uh, you won't be spending that much money. Um, you can shop around and find the same amino acids by different makers at different prices, and uh, you can do that. Um, you can also start with a blend, um, which will get you, you know, should make a difference. Um, and then you can monitor yourself on the questionnaire. Okay, this is really making a difference, but I still have, you know, on a scale of one to 10, uh, I'm no longer all tens, but I'm fives and I want to be zero. So maybe I'll add some individual aminos to the, the, the multi. Um, at any rate, I don't want you to be um, intimidated by the prospect of a super sophisticated and expensive uh, process. Uh, at this point, there are plenty of cheap amino acids out there and almost all of them are equally good. Awesome. Well, Julia, thank you so much for your time. I'm sure we can have many more enlightening conversations. I'm sure we will. Let's uh, do. We'll have you back on the show for sure. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Chris. Bye-bye.